Well, 2020 is finally over. We're probably a couple of weeks into 2021 by the time this video comes out. And what a wild ride this year has been. 2020 was rough for pretty much everybody. So before we jump into the topic of this video, I kind of want to focus in on something positive that came out of this year. 2020 was the year that I finally took the leap and started making content for YouTube and Twitch, and the support blew me away. Our little community has grown so much, and I'm so proud of all the positivity that everyone has brought for each other this year. To everyone in the community, thank you. Now let's talk games. 2020 brought some incredible experiences to the table. While quality of life was dropping for so many people, quality gaming experiences stood strong. But, uh... I'm actually not gonna be talking about a lot of games that released in 2020. I'm not typically the kind of person who feels a need to play a game the second it releases, unless I feel like spoilers are gonna be everywhere if I don't. So, this list is composed of a bunch of games that I played for the first time this year. Also, for the sake of simplicity, I grouped together any series that I played in their entirety. So, without further ado, let's talk about my 5 most disappointing and 10 most rewarding experiences of the year, plus 5 honorable mentions that didn't make it into the top 10 list. Getting the negatives out of the way first, at number 5 on my list of most disappointing games I played in 2020 is Baldur's Gate. Baldur's Gate is a CRPG developed by Bioware that originally released in 1998. Believe it or not, it would eventually go on to inspire the Dragon Age series nearly 10 years later. It was... okay. I mean, the controls are clunky and old and difficult, which was pretty much exactly what I was expecting. I normally wouldn't pick up an older CRPG like this one if it weren't for the fact that Baldur's Gate 3, which is being developed by Larian Studios, the people behind the Divinity series, recently entered early access. The Divinity series are known as some of the best CRPGs ever produced, and I fully expect Baldur's Gate 3 to live up to that reputation. I figured I would jump into the series and learn the story so I could catch all the references that might appear in the third game, but to anyone out there who's considering it, don't. You're wasting your time. The story's extremely minimal and not very enjoyable. The gameplay is a slog, and grinding through that just to get to a few bits of lore just isn't worth your time. Especially considering that one of the canon pieces of the storyline is a recently published adventure for D&D 5th Edition. You're gonna be spending a lot of time on this, albeit that part is one of the more enjoyable ones. Number 4. Ukulele A spiritual successor to Banjo-Kazooie developed by Platonic Games, including some of the original Banjo-Kazooie alumni developers, Ukulele positioned itself to be a guaranteed hit. It's full of character. The designs, the music, the gameplay, it all lines up perfectly. The characters control almost exactly how I would expect them to, and it's incredibly satisfying. The writing is super quirky, full of puns, and over-the-top character, and it's coupled with charming mumble speech just like the ones from Banjo-Kazooie. Grant Kirkhope even lent his hand to the soundtrack. Best known for his work on Banjo-Kazooie, it just made sense to have him on the project. And it worked out! The music for this game is incredible! The problem with ukulele is the level design. Levels are far too huge, even before accounting for the fact that each one can be expanded, sometimes even doubling in size. With collectibles scattered about pretty much anywhere, this gives you a lot of space to explore. Sounds great, right? Well, not exactly. Once you find the first collectibles in any stage, they start to feel empty. Prepare to spend a lot of time scouring vast, empty wastelands searching for collectibles. This empty feeling lands ukulele firmly in my top 5 most disappointing games I played this year. Number 3. Rayman I'm a huge fan of the Rayman series, especially the second game. The old 3D Rayman will always hold a strong presence in my heart, but this year was the first time I ever actually played the first entry in the franchise, and I've got to say, I wasn't impressed. The version I played was Rayman Forever on Ubisoft Connect, formerly Uplay. I was actually planning to make a video for the channel about it all the way back in January, and it was going to be my premiere video, but it ended up being such a negative experience that I canned the whole thing. Rayman is a difficult game, and I'm usually the kind of person who will tough it out and overcome the challenges that a game presents, and I did do that with Rayman. Problem is, it's not just hard, it's 
old school hard. To give you some context, older games often had to extend their playtime by punishing players relentlessly. Rayman is no exception to this. It's full of blind jumps, weird level design, unfair obstacles, and as a kicker, it sends you back to the main menu every time you get a game over. And you'll be getting a lot of game overs. The unfairness in the design of this game is what lands it on this list, and it's a shame because the rest of the franchise is absolutely amazing. Number 2. Chain. It might be a little unfair to put Chain on this list, but eh, I've gone and done it anyway. This game is a collaborative effort between 20 developers on itch.io, or actually I guess it's 20 games aimed at telling a single narrative. To quote the description page, the developers couldn't communicate with each other during development. Each developer would send their game to the next person in line who would make a follow-up. I love this concept, and I think it could be put to good use. The problem here is that it doesn't seem like all the developers got the memo. A couple of games do a hard reset and seemingly ignore the previous games in the line. However, if you enjoy weird experimental indie projects, it might be worth checking out. I've left a link in the description. Number 1. Costume Quest yeah, coming in at number one on my list of most disappointing games that I played this year is Costume Quest. Both games, the whole series. If you've seen my videos about the series, you may already know my thoughts on why I dislike them so much, but to sum it up here, they're a massive waste of great inspiration. The story borrows a lot from Halloween nostalgia, which many of my favorite memories are tied back to. I love autumn and I love Halloween. It's my favorite time of year. I would give anything to have a great game that represents how that season feels to me, and Costume Quest promises just that. But it falls flat. It scratches the surface of the aesthetic, sure. It also scratches the surface of the games it's inspired by, like Paper Mario. The game fails to properly explore its own themes and inspirations, and in the end, it feels like the developers didn't care nearly as much for its source material as they could have. I would love to give Costume Quest a great review, but I just can't. The shallow references and failure to properly explore its inspirations makes Costume Quest my biggest disappointment of this year. So yeah, that sums up all the negative stuff I have to say in this video. Next, I want to talk about the 10 best games I played this year. Let's not waste any time. Number 10, The Blackout Club. The Blackout Club is a co-op horror game about a group of teenagers investigating a monstrous secret that's been plaguing their small town. I'll admit, there is a lot to this game that I haven't had a chance to experience, but to sum up the basic gameplay loop, every night, all the adults in your town get out of bed and sleepwalk. In the morning, they wake up with no recollection of what happened or where they were. You play as a group of teenagers who investigate these strange events so you can prove what's going on to the rest of the world. This involves sneaking around town and using various skills and gizmos to collect evidence on the events, all the while evading some powerful entity that seems intent on stopping you. It honestly feels like a cool ghost hunt with Stranger Things sort of vibes. I picked this game up at the beginning of our first lockdown and played with a couple of friends who had recently moved away, and I have to say, it was a wonderful experience. And if you find yourself in possession of a copy of The Blackout Club, give it a shot. I totally recommend it. Number 9. Little Nightmares. Little Nightmares was great. It's a creepy puzzle platformer by Tarsier Studios and one of the better Halloween games I've played. Its aesthetic reminds me a lot of the stylized, Halloween-y, creepy sort of vibes given off by Tim Burton movies. The puzzles in the game are simple and straightforward, but where it really excels is in the atmosphere. The graphics are phenomenal. The soundscapes are too. Everything exudes that menacing, claustrophobic feeling of being on a grimy old ship with a bunch of giant cannibals who want to eat you. Don't worry too much though, this game may have some scary parts, but it's far more creepy than it is scary. This is a net positive in my opinion. The whole game almost equates to a walk through a haunted house. There are some spooky parts, but it's mostly about the atmosphere. Nobody's going to be jumping out at you with chainsaws, but it's definitely worthy of becoming a Halloween tradition, especially with its reasonable playtime of around 4 hours. Number 8. SpongeBob SquarePants Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated 
Admittedly, this entry may be cheating a little bit because it is a remake of a beloved game from my childhood, but SpongeBob SquarePants Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated did not disappoint. I loved the original as a child and picking up Rehydrated was like a blast from the past. I couldn't even count how many hours I put into this game as a kid, but this year was the first time that I played through the entire thing. I got every golden spatula and I loved it all the way through. My only real critiques are about how they changed the visual style slightly. SpongeBob's proportions seem a little off to me, and the color scheme of jellyfish fields hurts my eyes. Tone down the saturation, please! Aside from that and some quirks in the menu aesthetics, this game plays just like how I remember the original. Having a remaster of Battle for Bikini Bottom was like a dream come true. I never would have expected this to happen in a million years, but boy am I ever glad it did. Number 7. Fall Guys Ultimate Knockout Fall Guys is an extremely colorful Wipeout Takeshi's Castle game show themed battle royale about clumsy jelly beans. It's so easy to pick up and play and the matches go by super fast, making it a great game to play when you don't have the time to sit down and play a longer, more dedicated game. Fall Guys can get pretty repetitive during longer play sessions as each mini game tends to repeat fairly frequently, and if you're not super great at it right away, this can be even more true as the first round never has all too much variability. But I think this one is best experienced with friends. Hop in a voice chat together, join a team, and duke it out to see who can last the longest. Don't focus too much on skill or winning, but it can be a wonderful thing to do while chatting with your pals, and it can supply some good laughs along the way. Also, the bass lines from this soundtrack are incredible. Number 6. Grease Grease is another game that I covered here on the channel. It was actually the video directly before this one, and I have to say, it blew me away. I was not expecting an experience as emotional and powerful as this one. Grease is an artistic masterpiece. Through its metaphorical story told without words, to the visual aesthetic, and a soundtrack that never fails to give me goosebumps. I've never seen a game portray a message so accurately without directly addressing what it actually is. The game moved me and made me experience emotions that I really needed. Most impressively, it does all of this without forgetting about the gameplay. Controlling Grease is intuitive and feels satisfying, and tutorials are simplistic and non-intrusive. Nomada Studio really outdid itself with this game. I highly, highly recommend checking it out. I also wouldn't mind if you checked out my video on the game, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> Number 5. Animal Crossing New Horizons Animal Crossing New Horizons was my first foray into the Animal Crossing franchise. I don't know how they did it, but Nintendo has made me completely and utterly nostalgic for something I only experienced for the first time less than a year ago. This game isn't for everybody. It's super laid back, mostly directionless, and takes place in real time. That means certain characters will only visit you on certain days, and stores close at 10pm. It's the sort of game you may or may not have to schedule yourself around. At least, if you don't time travel. You can manipulate the game by changing the clock on your console to get around the real time aspect. What really made this game shine for me is how it connected me and my friends during the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. We were all playing this game daily, showing off how we decorated our islands, visiting each other, and just hanging out. I think the same can be said for a lot of people. And for that reason, Animal Crossing New Horizons will always mean the world to me. Number 4. Bioshock this year was the first time I played the Bioshock series. I hadn't touched any of them until now, but they've been on my backlog for years. Honestly, I'd consider them essential. <laughs> the references made in these games are present everywhere, and the impact they had on the gaming industry is gargantuan. Hell, without Bioshock, we wouldn't have the term ludonarrative dissonance, which, by the way, is the conflict between a game's narrative told through the story and the narrative told through the gameplay. The first Bioshock game is kind of a good example of that. What impressed me so thoroughly about the series is its world building and environmental storytelling. The lore of Rapture and Columbia is enthralling. I loved it, and the series really captured my heart. It started off slow for me, as things usually do in older games like the first Bioshock, but by the time you reach Bioshock Infinite, the gameplay and storytelling have been nearly perfected. I'm tempted to make videos on the channel about these because of how strongly I resonated with the series. So, if you want to hear my full thoughts on this, would you kindly leave a comment down below? Number 3. 
The Last of Us. This year wasn't the first time I played The Last of Us, but it was the year The Last of Us Part 2 released. Also, I admittedly haven't finished the new game yet, but I'm already in love nonetheless. Joel and Ellie's story is incredible, and Naughty Dog always excels at delivering a cinematic experience while still using every aspect of the game to their advantage. Tension is built and released through gameplay, and subplots are told through the environment. Exploring all the abandoned homes to discover who these people were, reading notes hidden throughout the world to learn about their story, everything about these games is incredibly well done. That's not to mention the sheer amount of accessibility options in part two. This game went above and beyond. I was skeptical about it at first because of the initial outroar and about just how many awards it won at the Game Awards, but after only making it about a third of the way through so far, I can honestly say it deserved it. Number two, Celeste. Celeste is another game that I covered on the channel. If you want to hear my full thoughts, I highly recommend checking out that video. But to summarize, Celeste's story is incredibly emotional, and the struggles that face Madeline are super relatable. Her journey up the mountain is plagued with hardships, both internal and external. It's an endearing, emotional, and sometimes adorable experience that's made into what it is by well-written and relatable characters. The gameplay supports this too. The controls are snappy and responsive, and difficulty is incredibly well designed. Every death, every failure feels fair. The game never punishes you for it either. Every try is a learning experience, a chance to improve and progress. The challenges ramp up at a decent rate, and every new mechanic that's introduced is done so at the best pace imaginable. They're all integrated into the experience, never giving you enough time to forget how they work, and never spiking the difficulty so much that learning becomes its own challenge. It's hard to find a game that uses progression so well to its advantage. Before we jump into the number one spot for this year, I want to go over some rapid fire honorable mentions. These are games I wanted to include in the list, but didn't quite make the cut. So in no particular order, those are... Firewatch, a great walking simulator that tells an emotional story. Among Us, this game stresses me out to no end, but it's a great way to spend a night with friends. Watch Dogs 2, I love the Watch Dogs series and this was no exception. Dark. This is an awesome puzzle game with Tim Burton vibes all over it. Pokemon Sword and Shield, Isle of Armor and Crown Tundra DLC. Finally, a step in the right direction for the Pokemon series. And at the number one spot for the best games I played in 2020, we have... The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. And A Hat in Time. I know, I know, it's a tie. I couldn't choose, okay? <laughs> These are two incredibly different games that placed first for incredibly similar reasons. Breath of the Wild is responsible for effectively rebooting the Zelda franchise. They took the regular gameplay loop that everyone expects and flipped it on its head. Gone now are the series of expansive puzzle box dungeons, and here come a ton of small shrines and open world exploration. Every challenge can be approached in countless ways, and the game capitalizes on the potential that the Zelda series has always had. Would I have preferred a more linear experience with more extensive dungeons like earlier 3D Zelda games? Sure, I think I would, but this game opens up a wild world of possibility that cannot be denied. Breath of the Wild is one of the best games I played this decade, and I'm sure I'll continue to pick up and play it for years to come. A Hat in Time is a masterpiece of platforming. Each of its levels are themed incredibly well. Characters are iconic, well-designed, and beautifully written. The gameplay is fluid and feels great to control. The music is fantastic too. It's so upbeat and nostalgic, which is one of A Hat in Time's biggest characteristics. It captures the nostalgic platforming experience unlike any of the other indie platformers that aimed for the same goal. Ukulele, eat your heart out. Both of these games deserve first place on this list for those reasons alone, but what they have most in common is you. That might sound cheesy, but I mean it. Breath of the Wild is how I kicked off my Twitch channel, and A Hat in Time was my premier YouTube video. These games were the beginning of a new avenue for my personal life, and the start to a wonderful community. I've made so many new friends and continue to see people make new friends here on YouTube, Twitch, and in the Discord server, hopefully for years to come. This year was the start to something incredible, and we've all accomplished so much together. From forming our own incredibly accepting, supportive, and encouraging community, to founding friendships and even supporting great causes. 
Seriously, we raised over $2,114.69 for Able Gamers over the holiday season, and that's all thanks to you. Now that money can go toward introducing new gamers to a wonderful and accepting community that they otherwise may not have been able to participate in. Despite all the mayhem that this year has caused, I'm incredibly thankful for all the positives that have come out of it. I'm so proud of the community that we've built together, and I look forward to fostering it for years to come. Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys next time.